بس ما اقول Go ahead. Bismillah, the world, when the best kudus, Adam, Lak, Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Hallelujah. For the sake of the church, you were struck in the public place so that you could make her holy with your venerable blood. For her sake, the church, you carried the infernal chains and you endured the unclean saliva as one without trespasses. God was crucified upon the tree of the cross. Hallelujah. Look towards us, O Lord. May your forgiveness be a helper unto us and do not cast us away. Have mercy upon us. Spare us. O Lord, O Lord, forgive us. Have mercy on us, Father. Hallelujah. Forgive us, Son. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, merciful one, remember us in your forgiveness. Have mercy on us, Father. Hallelujah. Forgive us, Son, hallelujah. Holy Spirit, merciful one, remember us in your forgiveness. Have mercy on us, Father, hallelujah. Forgive us, Son, hallelujah. Holy Spirit, merciful one, remember us in your forgiveness. Unto you we send glory, and unto you we ascend thanks. Have mercy on us, merciful one, destroy our sins. And save us. Place our breath of life and our flesh in your bosom. Christ, Son of God. Our God. And our Savior. Jesus Christ, forgive us. In the multitude of your mercy. Crush our transgressions. And send your forgiveness upon us. From you. Also forgive. Hallelujah, have mercy on us, Father, merciful one. And forgive us. Grant your forgiveness, merciful one. Do not wipe us out as you remember our past. With your mercy. You are a merciful one. And a multitude of your forgiveness is there for those who call upon you. They call upon you in righteousness. And you always hear. You are almighty in salvation. Almighty. In salvation. Our God, his word is righteous. We petition the Father. To send to us his forgiveness. The Father is enough for those who petition him. Hallelujah. Glory unto him is due. Hallelujah, thanks unto him is due. Hallelujah. To Christ, to the Lord of all. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And today, who is my hope? It became the Lord. Into your hand, O Lord. I entrust my breath of life to the God of mercy. I entrust my breath of life to the King of glory. I entrust my breath of life with my Lord and my God. I entrust my breath of life from all works of evil. Save my breath of life to the God of mercy. One moment, sorry. <laughs> I entrust my breath of life to the King of glory. I entrust my breath of life with my Lord and my God. I entrust my breath of life from all the works of evil. Save my breath of life to the God of mercy. I entrust my breath of life to the King of glory. I entrust my breath of life with my Lord and my God. I entrust my breath of life from all works of evil. Save my breath of life. Come. Let us petition him. Let us petition him. Let us seek his instruction. Our righteous God, 
His word is righteous. He is almighty. There is nothing he cannot do. God of the needy, helper of the afflicted. We entrust ourselves to you. He is almighty. There is nothing he cannot do. God of the needy, comforter of the sorrowful. We entrust ourselves to you. He is almighty. There is nothing he cannot do. We entrust ourselves to you. God of the needy, hope of the despondent. We entrust ourselves to you. As you protected us from day to night, likewise protect us, O Lord, from night to day. As you protected us from day to night, likewise protect us, O Lord, from night to day. As you protected us from day to night, likewise protect us, O Lord, from night to day. Forgive, O Lord, your earth. Hallelujah. Hear our prayer. And our petition and destroy all of our sin. Hear our prayer. And our petition, as you heard the prayer of the petition of Ezra. Receive our lamentation. May your peace not be distant in our midst. Amen. Let us say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and leave us not, Lord, in temptation, but deliver us and rescue us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Holy Virgin Mary, in the peace of the angel Gabriel, peace be unto thee. Thou art virgin in spirit as well as in body. O thou mother of perfect God, peace be unto thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Rejoice, O thou who art full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Ask and pray for us, thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, that he may have mercy upon our souls and forgive us our sins. Amen. Glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, my beloved brethren and sisters, to the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast. Today, you see the welcome came in a little late because I am joined by our special guest, Deacon Minilik, and... We were able to open today with prayers of the good is right in the Eastern uh, or the Greek church. They call this Vespers. We would call it, you know, in, in the Anglican tradition, they would call it even song or evening prayers. This is within our Sa'atat, which is a portion of the hours of the, the liturgy or the Kaddase portion of the traditional teaching. This is called Maharan Na'ab or have mercy on us, Father. And it is the typical even song or evening prayers or Vespers of the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawahedo Church or of the G'izrite. And so we were able to pray the good is right with Deacon Menelik, who has wonderful icons behind him. And I assume uh, his beatitude of blessed memory, Abuna Yisak. Why don't you introduce the people to how it's possible that you're able to be a disciple of Abuna Yisak, to have the icons behind you, to pray according to the good is right, and to have the name that you have, to be born from the jump orthodox, but maybe uh, run into some language issues when you're running around Ethiopia and people think that you are uh, just one of them. <laughs> First, I must say, uh, thank you, beloved brother, Deacon Henuk, for uh, inviting me here. Um, you know, I, I, have, I haven't done this before, so uh, this is new to me, but uh, I, I do appreciate the opportunity for me to share a little bit of history. Uh, so thank you again uh, for inviting me. Uh, so, I guess, right, so my name is Menelik, I'm not Ethiopian, I'm a deacon, so how does that, right? How does those <laughs> yeah, happy Menelik, it was just yeah, his just birthday, people were celebrating his birthday, your namesake. Oh, that's true, I did see a picture today, somebody did send me, uh, King Menelik, yeah, may he rest in peace. Okay. So, uh, so a little bit about my history. Um, my parents are from uh, the Caribbean, Jamaican background. Uh, so both my parents were born in Jamaica. Uh, but if we go more historically, how the Jamaicans 
come to understand or learn about or desire uh, mm -hmm. Ethiopia. Uh, and I would say it was a cry heard across the ocean uh, to their brothers in the homeland. So we're talking about historically African descendants of slave in the diaspora throughout the, the new world uh, start to look towards Africa for a sign of hope. And so today, actually significant today, we celebrate the birthday of Marcus Garvey. Uh, Marcus, a lot, maybe much people may not know about him, but uh, Marcus Garvey is a significant figure in that whole Pan-Africanist Back to Africa movement, which was very influential uh, throughout the Western world uh, in, the, in the 1920s, early 1900s. Uh, so he was a, a beacon for that Pan-African movement. And so Jamaica was where he was from. Uh, uh, so, you know, he's, he's actually a national hero in Jamaica, uh, not in America, unfortunately, but in Jamaica is a national hero. In, in the so, conscious, in the conscious community, I think they, they would still no, consider him a hero, but you're right. Yeah, not necessarily globally, in the history books. Yes. Not necessarily historically in America, there's some, uh, controversy from the government, but that's not, that's not new. Right. Uh, so, um, Marcus Garvey pointed African descendants of slave towards Ethiopia, right? Uh, his thing was like, the, you know, Chinese men have their God and white men and so forth and so on. At that time, you know, race was very big. And so he said the black men should look towards Ethiopia, you know. Uh, and of course, this was a time right before uh, the late Emperor Hadi Selassie was coronated. And so uh, when people heard about that, it was like, OK, you know, Mark, this is this is what Marcus Garvey is talking about. And so there was a request from people in that Garveyite movement writing letters to Ethiopia, you know, trying to find out information. Of course, they studied, they know that Christianity was there. And so they started to request the church to come. And so, and you can find more information about this. There is a, a notable pioneer, I would say, in this, a person who actually visited Ethiopia. Uh, he passed away. He was a priest uh, in Trinidad. His, his name is Dr. Uh, he's a Kez in the church, uh, Springer, Kez Springer. If you look him up on YouTube, he actually gives you details about his journey to Ethiopia and so forth. But as I digress, uh, they called you know, for the church to come. And so throughout the years, the church, you know, throughout the decades, uh, it came after the war, the war effort, uh, organizations like the Ethiopian World Federation. Uh, so uh, there was a big movement towards Ethiopia. So Jamaica became uh, one of those countries that proudly, uh, you know, will call themselves Ethiopian born in the West, you know? And so they started to learn about Ethiopia um, even some people, uh, they started to create a new movement in, in Jamaica, like the Rastafarian mm -hmm. movement, uh, that started in Jamaica. And that was around the time after Holly Slice was coronated and all this, uh, some people thought that, uh, the revelations talked about him. And so there was a movement that followed that. Uh, so, so that was, that became very popular in Jamaica and of course spread globally and even now. We know that the Rastafarian com community is uh, quite large on the global scale. So my parents, I think, were around that. You know, hear that, hearing that message, you know, they they were born in the '60s, grew up in the '70s, so uh, they start to hear about different things in Jamaica. But then, it was the will of God for that call to be answered in Jamaica, particularly for the church to reach there. I believe it was 1970. And when the church uh, finally came to Jamaica, but prior to that, it, it, it took years for it to, to arrive. Uh, Emperor Haile Selassie visited Jamaica in 1966. And uh, of course, he was welcome. At that time, the Rastafarian concept has, had developed, and they actually, some people even deified him. They thought he was the second coming of Christ, Christ reincarnated, all different type of things. So uh, uh, when he arrived, you know, you could actually see the video. Like, uh, it was like total chaos for the king, you know, like a crisis here. But anyways, uh, you know, you can actually see the video of that. So he visited he visited Jamaica and, you know, he saw that people had a strong zeal towards Ethiopia and for him himself. And so uh, part of his solution was to let the church come there. But the first place that the church did reach outside of Ethiopia, besides Jerusalem, the first place that the church arrived was in, um, I believe it was Trinidad in 1952 unofficially and then after trinidad it was guyana 
Um, these were both in the 50s. After that, 1959, it was established in the United States. Um, and then Jamaica finally in 1970. So uh, the church officially came in the 50s outside. Uh, and you can, it's a very interesting story how he, how the, the person who went to Ethiopia to ask for the church, it's a very interesting story how he went. You can, you can look it up. And, uh, Cassie Springer, can, right? You said Cassie Springer? Yes. Kezi Springer. He, he gave yeah. his interview before he passed. We'll make sure to link to him on the YouTube so that people could, could look into it. Okay. Yes. Uh, cause you know, it is important for us to know the history. Like, uh, how did the Ethiopian church came here before, you know, there weren't much Ethiopians here. Uh, a few handful of students who came to learn. Uh, this is a time when, you know, when uh, before the Derek era, when when uh, it was still a monarch in Ethiopia. And so it was mostly uh, Pan-Africanist, people of the Caribbean African descent. Uh, and of course, you know, Emperor Haile Selassie, like, tried to personally endorse the mission. It actually was an official mission called the Tewahedo mission. Uh, and there's actually, we can look into that in the Synodus. There's actually information about that we can look into. Uh, and so, uh, this is what my parents came out of. So, them following the Rastafarian movement, uh, there was a time period when my mother was still in Jamaica. My father was, when they first got uh, married, my, my mother's in Jamaica. My father was here in the United States. And uh, he found the church in the United States, even though there was one in Jamaica. So he told my mother about the one in Jamaica. So she went to the church in Jamaica. His her experience, her first experience was in Jamaica. His first experience coming into the church was in New York City, in Holy Trinity, where I still serve, where I was born, raised, and everything. We'll talk about that later. So, uh, you know, she, my mother was attracted to the prayers. They did the, it was it was uh, the kibbutz that they were performing. And it was in English. I was just going to ask that. Was let me, it originally let me very clear. Yes. Or English? Yeah. This whole mission was in English. So Emperor Haile Selassie in 1959 commissioned the Coptic Church to translate the, the liturgy from the Ethiopic into uh, English. And so those those were some of the uh, first set of materials that we have, have had in English translated officially. And yeah. um, some other like... Mar Mark da the was it Marcos Daoud or something? Yes. I think he's a bishop. If he's still alive, he was a bishop at that time. Marcus Dawood is his name. Uh, he translated the book. Uh, it was personally commissioned by Emperor Haile Selassie. Uh, you know, I think he understood the importance of English, uh, you know, using as a tool for the mission of the church. For, for that matter, so, we were talking before the camera got rolling. It was uh, Emperor Haile Selassie who forced the church to translate into Amharic the Bible itself and actually the the Islamic communities to translate the Quran into Amharic. He thought it was very mm -hmm. important that folks have a vernacular language understanding. So the same principle that he attached of translating from Giz into Amharic and from Arabic into Amharic, he translated from Giz into to English through commission, like you said. Yes. And so uh, that was that was one of me. So my mother, you know, never hearing prayers like this in her life, you know, in, in Jamaica, it's a very, uh, you know, like in school, you would pray. So, you know, they, they knew about Bible stories. It was part of the curriculum, actually, in Jamaica. You know, yeah. Jamaica was a British colony at the time. So like the Anglican Church was like the National Church of Jamaica and so forth. So in school, they would pray. So she knew about God. But her going now uh, to, to this Ethiopian church, hearing these prayers for the first time. She said that was it. That's all she needed to hear. That one, you know, those those prayers, the prayers of the covenant, and that would that gravitate gravitated her towards the church in Jamaica. And my father, the same thing. You know, then I was born, right? Like they they found the church, they joined the church. Um, uh, my mother moved to the United States with my father, so uh, most of their time they 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 actually uh, spend most of their time in, in New York, attending services at Holy Trinity in New York. Again, established in 1959. So this is, uh, I was born in 1986. So my mother came here in 1981, I believe. And so from, from uh, you know, I have many other siblings that were born before and after me. Um, and so uh, I was born and raised in that. Like they were already members of the church, uh, serving diligently members, you know, be, be very, very involved. Um, one important person, like you mentioned before, my father, late Abu Nisak, he was very instrumental. He was... You know, for me, he was like my grandfather. I was closer to him than, than my grandfather. Uh, he was personally sent by his majesty to uh, 
to serve us here because he was part of the church mission, the early mission in the in the fifties, right? So uh, he had a lot of experience when it was time for Jamaica to be established. He was chosen by his Majesty personally to go, and you know, at that time, a church official was a diplomat of the country, so you know, it wasn't a small welcome. He was welcome, not like his majesty to, to Jamaica, but when he came to Jamaica, you can find in news articles, uh, he was very much welcome as a diplomat of the country. You know, at that time, church and state wasn't separated. So that's right. Uh, it's very magical error, you know? So uh, uh, prior, prior to that, he was also a part of the mission that helped establish a church in the United States. So he was very active uh, all his life, most of his life, very active in this. And of course, if, if many don't know, he actually became the bishop, eventually he became the bishop in 1979 for the entire Western Hemisphere was his, under his diocese, probably the largest diocese in the history of our church, maybe? Probably. Yeah, for, well, let, yes, let people, let, yeah. let that sink in, let that sink in for people. He's talking about the Caribbean, North America, South America, all of it was under the jurisdiction of one Europe. mega bishop. Europe, Europe, Europe as South well. South Africa. He established oh a church God. in South Africa. A lot of people don't know that. He established a church in South Africa because Beautiful. South African people were calling, you know. Um, so, you know, he had a, he had a big mission, and so uh, through the grace of God, my parents were sent to help him. You know, uh, like like a history of our church, we go through trials and tribulations. So the mission went through some trials and tribulations where funding was lacking and different different things. So my parents, when they met him, they found him in hard conditions. He was actually living out of his suitcase, and it was. It was kind of tough. Even the building, it was a church building, but like a part of it was like abandoned and, you know, it wasn't really uh, being taken care of. So, and so my parents and my aunt and uncle, they decided to move because the church uh, facility had a uh, housing, right? And so they saw him in that, in that state and they decided to move in to help him, you know, and that's how they, they drew closer. And this is a unique time in history because this is when the Dirk, was like very active in the Red Terror, and a lot of people were leaving Ethiopia, coming to the United States. And so in the United States, this was this was like the safe haven. This was like the place where people come after they left the country. They would come here to this place. So my mother met many royal family people, noble people throughout throughout those years, you know. Uh Bonisak being instrumental in helping his people to come. Uh and so um, you know, I was born, raised in the church attending church in English all my life. Um, I've seen the transgression, the, the, uh, the transition from from uh, where we used to sing songs with keyboards and, uh, uh, you know, like like traditional gospel songs. We used to sing that where, you know, we get the teachers to come and eventually teach us. So now it was like all this where we like, we play the kebado and everything. Uh, so, like a cult, uh, a cultural shift, I think. Uh, for those, I, I understand shift. what you're saying, but I Being think um, what what you're saying is that there was some sense in which, through the Tawahado mission of Abuna Isak, the cultural contour of the church is resembling some of the Caribbean communities. But as the demographics change and more and more Ethiopians come, uh, it, it, there becomes to be. Um, more of a switch or a transition back to how the church would look maybe in Ethiopia and less so the, the culture in the United States. Is that fair? Yes. Um, I, I would say that, and that, that is a parish by parish basis because uh, elements still exist in the Caribbean. And if you go to the churches in the Caribbean, you as, as an Ethiopian, so say, say you go, Henok, to, to, mm -hmm. to Jamaica and visit, uh, and you go to service in Holy Trinity in Kingston, for example. Uh, after Godban, you're going to hear them. They're going to bring out like um, some traditional West African drums and they're going to sing some English hymns. The Naya Bingi? Uh, yeah, Naya Bingi drums and they're going to sing some traditional hymns. Uh, you know, that was that was our, that was was our my view of a choir at that time. Yes. But it was uh, the will of God for us to learn. Like, you know, we're, we were babies in that sense. If you think about it, you know, Ethiopia having the church for thousands of years, us having yeah. it for a couple of decades is like, okay, we're growing, you know, yes. in the infancy stage. But anyways, uh, uh, you know, that, that was how it was at the time. Um, but it was the will of God for me uh, to be taught uh, by a special teacher that his, his eminence of Bonisak had brought. Um, his name is Marigeta Afawark. And so 
uh, from a young age, we were being nurtured with like all the traditions of Ethiopia. Like we knew some stuff, but, like the details, you know, like the traditional schooling that you have done in Ethiopia, we start to get exposure to that. And so a lot of transition happened, you know, development. Uh, but, but of course, um, you know, I would say that issues in, in, in Ethiopia started to come over in the West, you know, started to come over in the West and Abu Isaac had a big responsibility. Like I, like we just said, Western Hemisphere and now influx of Ethiopians coming in. This is when now you started to have churches established that's like all in Harab speaking. It wasn't until the 80s that that happened, you know, from 1959 up to like the mid 80s. Like all the churches that were here were all English, performing English for the English African diaspora in California, um, uh, here, in, like I said, New York, in the Caribbean, in Europe. Yeah, Los Angeles, my own home, the first church was uh, Tekla Haimano Church. Tekla Haimano Church. And that was in the 70s, you know, like when Black Panther was like, you know. And so, um, so Bunisak had a, had a, a little, he had, you know, he had a lot in his plate responsible for this mission. But now his brothers and sisters are like coming in waves from the from the country. So but anyways, that allowed for clergymen to start to come too. different clergymen, different teachers uh, start to come. And now the churches in D.C., you know, D.C. became like the hub. A lot of churches, Mariam churches. So all the churches in D.C., most of them he established, like all the churches in the United States, majority of them he established. Any, any church that was here in the 90s, he established himself. He was the bishop because there was no other bishop here. Uh, until until he brought his his brother bishops, as we know some of the history. Did. So, um, and, you know, he he would get some help from Ethiopia, but because of what was going on, you know, he had to do what he had to do, you know. But uh, it was a will of God for for me to be trained uh, eventually um, to become a deacon in the church uh, um, by by our teacher and medical staff work. So I started to learn the traditional things. Of course, even me when I when I hear about the tradition. Uh, you know, being that I don't have the native language, like we, I didn't like. For example, I we learned that at the age of seven, you have to uh, <laughs> be able to chant uh, or recite the Psalms of David, like all 151 chapters. You know, so may, may I live up to that one day? Amen. <laughs> so us, us learning about that, it was it, it was exciting. Of course, we, we know we'll never get to that level, but for us to know that that's the rigor and uh, you know that that the training required and so um and you got a day I job like you're do, you're doing this on the side you got a day job whereas these young men in the traditional school they basically leave their homes and go full time and so they're kind of full time students from yeah. from whatever age 7 10 13 until they're in their 20s and 30s they're full time in the traditional school learning good yeah. poetry or learning the eucharistic liturgy or the non eucharistic liturgy you're trying to learn whatever bits and pieces you can in your free time in the united states so yeah. uh, as much as as you admire them you know there there is admiration in what you're doing which is why we're highlighting your story today so i thank you brother yeah so, uh, you know, so we were, we were privileged to have somebody who went through that training, right? To like coach us in a sense. And so uh, it was a will of God for us to have that. And for even him, he was in Jamaica for a couple of years prior to that to teaching in Jamaica too. And so uh, 2003, when I was ordained a diakon, at that time I was 16 years old, 17, 2003. And I've been serving since that time. Um, I was ordained at St. Gabriel's Church here in New Jersey. I currently serve in uh, Holy Trinity Church in New York City. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that's how that's a little bit of my history. It was all over the place. But uh, if you ask me some more direct questions, I know you're good at that. Yes, yes, yes. I, I, it's, it's very beautiful. So you, you talked about a sort of cultural shift, right? So in the beginning, it's all English. And for those who are watching, the kind of major episodes is in 1975. You have the Marxist communist overturning of the monarchy. And 1991, you have a what I would call a pseudo Marxist still new regime, which is the current regime and takeover. In both scenarios, the state is becoming divorced. There's no more church and state, as Deacon Minilik describes, that the original message came in the form of a state dignitary who is an archbishop, where there is church and state together. But you have two uh, following regimes that are very antithetical 
to the church and you know that there was much persecution and that's some of the politics that he's talking about some of it is theological differences but i want to hear from you how did you begin you know incorporating amharic and giz because when you visited our parish several times for english dasi or liturgy i remember that our ad the administrator of our church the monk he had no idea who you you and your brother uh, deacon abraha were and you absolutely wowed him and stunned him with your knowledge of Giz, Amharic, and English. Not to say that you're masters of teaching the languages, but certainly you know the the relevant language for the liturgy. So, uh, talk to us about how you know how you're doing English liturgy versus when the Amharic and Giz begins being incorporated. Okay. Uh, by the way, I don't know if something wrong with my phone. I can't I can't hear you that well. Let me see if there's something wrong with my part. All right. So how how do we how did I become familiar with? So I would say it, it is a liturgy, right? I, have, I will have to give credit uh, to our teacher. Uh, so growing up, most of the liturgy was done, I would say, 85% English. Some things you can't do in English, like, uh, like for example, in the opening prayers, uh, like Ahadu, the priest chants. From a young age, that was that was always something that I heard, um, and certain other chants too, like that you can't can't really take out of it, you know, out, out of the liturgy. Um, but I think it was our teacher like exposing us to the traditions, and so you know, as we learn, we practiced, right? So he'll teach us something, and we practice it. He teaches something, we practice it, to so where it became normal, uh, and so. Um, uh, of course, learning the Fidel was important. I was lazy when I was younger, so it, like, eventually I started to become better. Like now, now I'm okay. I can I can read Fidel. Like I can't read like as fluently, but I can recognize every character, and so that that helped us uh, in learning. You know, that was the main key: Re recognizing the alphabet so that you can get the pronunciation. You know, you can't say re. You have to say re. You, <laughs> you have to roll you your say, r's. So you, have, right. you have to know which one is te. Which was ka, which is ka. So like all of these, uh, you know, all, all of the, the the language, the alphabets, that helped us to to recognize. Of course, you know, um, he himself would create like, uh, you know, at that time where like this one was used for in the computer, he st he would create, he would take the liturgy, like the things that we were study, and side by side, give us English with the is, you know. The transliteration. Uh, in terms of Amharic, my Amharic is very poor. We didn't have much exposure to Amharic. It's all like traditional liturgy. So any language of the liturgy is what we were exposed to. And even what we used to do too, a big part of my history with, the, with this teacher was that we would travel as a choir because he would teach us Mahalet, like the services Mahalet, like uh, Aquaquam and a different type of Dugwa. And we would, we would learn it and recite it you know, uh, we learn the meaning of it. And so, and so Abu Nisak would actually, wherever he traveled, he'll travel with us. And so we would perform. There, there's probably, there's my, maybe not on YouTube, but pretty, a lot of home videos and a lot of, you know, when there's still tape deck before digital. Uh, quite a few traveling, especially in the holy days around this season after the new year. Every weekend we're in DC, we're in Virginia. And so uh, that's how we got exposed to the community too, like the, at large. This is my, like, even for me to see, more than one altar in a church or a warehouse church like that blew my mind when i went to dc, DC. this is the 90s 2000s 2000 you know early 2000s and so i would say us learning how to perform the mahalat and everything like that you know we're exposed to stuff that people took years to get to in ethiopia so our teacher kind of gave us the condensed version of what he went through you know and as children you're sponges so you absorb it you know yep and, and some of you know and and our it was mostly my my cousins, myself, uh, it was a group of us. So it was me, my older brother, uh, Deacon Abraha, my older cousin, Deacon Johannes, my younger cousin, Deacon Berdikat, and then my sister, Salam uh, And And then I had my, my two younger brothers and my two younger cousins. Of course, they, they didn't really know. You know, they were young, but they were still part of the choir. You know, uh, and so the, the main it was the five of us, like the four boys and the one girl. And I must say, my, my sister is a teacher. You should interview her one day. 
she's I would say she's a Mariketa. I think I think we met at the at your your niece's baptism or your yes. nephew's baptism. So she's, she's, a, she's a teacher as well. I would say. A, a Mari and Marit, uh, we could so, say. Yeah. So I think that um that experience over the, and we did that for years, many years. Um uh, that allowed us to learn Kebaro, how to do Snasil, Sefat, everything. Like and we didn't do it the traditional way. So like whatever the, whatever does the, was the prerequisite, I never learned that. I just we just whatever we were taught, we recited. But then we 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 gained an appreciation for it, you know? Then we gained an appreciation of the Giz language. But on top of that, we used to get every Sunday we used to have uh like Bible study and our teacher would read read Giz and then translate in English. Reading Giz, translating English. Reading in Giz, translating English. So I would say you know, I was born sharing it right like from my t from a young teenager to up to this point and so it was you know by the grace of god that i continued in it you know it was his, by his grace that we continue to and you Amen. appreciate and i appreciate my because you know as a child you didn't understand why your parents pushing me to do this and like why i have to go why can't i play football and you know all this <laughs> stuff so uh but my father pushed his his zeal came from like seeing how how you know, Hebrew schools, they push your children. And said, so he, he was like, no, we have to copy that system. We have to push them, push them, push them. You know, I, I, you know it, was, it, was, it was good that he did that. You know, I would say, uh, you know, we could have went in many different directions, but we stayed in the church. Uh, and we get an appreciation for the church and we love it, you know. And so that's right. And, and I myself, I have a personal desire to learn more kids and. Uh, because I, I know that there's a lot of information that's not yet translated. And so uh, some people are thirsty for this, you know, me being one of them. So. Yeah, that's right. So that's part of the, the project that we collaborated on. Another reason we opened with that Maharan Na'ab or that even song, that, that Ethiopian even song or, or Vespers or evening prayer is that, you know, I had this base translation and Deacon Menelik reached out to me. He saw it. He was a fan. He said, let me edit some things. I said, let's do it. And he added some beautiful colors to it. And he, I had just the English translation. He put the, the G's actually itself, as well as the G's transliteration and the English in kind of a three, three line format so that people could learn the English. They could see how it's pronounced if they can't read Fidel or the G's alphabet. And then if they know the G's alphabet, they can follow along. So it's, it's almost like, you you have it tiered and stratified so that you know yeah. people could look at it together like a priest could look at it with young members of a choir or young deacons and it's almost like yes. an you turned it into an intergenerational tool and i like yeah. that so and, you know uh, the format was done by and you may know it there's a small little red liturgy like a red paperback one that uh was i know done it. by somebody in california but of course abunisak endorsed it and commissioned it and so you know when, when, I remember when they were first published, that I was like, "Wow!" And so we use that. That's a. I'm used so used to that format. So when we do our PowerPoint presentations, for example, we do PowerPoint for Kadasi. Same thing. We do the. Uh, it is transliterated in English, you know. Uh, and we and of course uh, certain things are Samharic. We try to put them hard in here too. No, no, no offense, Samharic. It's just that you know the traditional. Is yeah, I'm no, Amhar Amharic itself, as we mentioned, is a kind of compromise position that comes about from the emperor so people can hear things more. But traditionally, Amharic and Tigrinya, let alone uh, Afanoromo, Guraginya, Harar, all these other languages, they're not the main language that the church has used. It, it is it is good. So it's interesting. You said you had to learn it, but you struggled a little bit with the Fidel in, in terms of interest, but you loved the church. And, and it's good that you know, you weren't compelled to to do one that you were able to seek God with whatever information you had. One of the big roles of a deacon is is reading scripture out loud in the liturgy. I've written an article about that before and how we can take that practice outside the liturgy. Did you always read in English or did they kind of push you to read in Amharic or did they have you try to read it in Giz? No, thank God. Even now, I only read in English. Even when I serve, I only read in English, right? So so I know all the traditional chants of the deacon, for example, like all the traditional chanting, for the most part, I know. Like anything that's long, more than two paragraphs, uh, I don't. But uh, I usually read it in English. So um, 
we were not forced. For example, there's a litany, right? That the that the deacon says, they say segudo, right? Worship the Lord with fear, and then we bow down. And the priest has a part, and then the deacon has his part. Yeah, banta kadisat for the sake of holy you things. What call it? Banta kadisat. Yes. So banta kadisat for the sake of holy things or holy for the matters. Sake of holy things. Yes. So um, I always do it in English. I don't. Yeah. I cannot. I'm, I don't have the ability to read it in Amharic or Giz. For those at home, it's so, the part that uh, the people say, Amen. And if so, even me, traditionally, we grew up saying, Amen, son, Lord have mercy upon us. That's how we said it, you know? The Kirelai son is, is the Greek language that's like there, you can't take it out. It's like, leave it. We know what it means. Uh, so we, that's how we used to do it. And so uh, even now, the church that I go to, I would say is predominantly Amharic speaking, even the priest himself, uh, even though it was established with only English speaking people, but the irony in that is like, but now it's like a balance and we still have English speaking people. I'm me being one of the, the clergy there. And so, uh, even the priest, no, he, he makes it, he makes it important because if you make it important for us to have, uh, English and everything. So even him himself, certain parts of the liturgy, he will stop, he'll read Amharic and he'll go to English and, you know, it is two, he'll do three languages, you know? And so, but for me, Reading the Bible out loud, always in English. Um, even recently, I just learned how to say the verses, like uh, like lend it to the Hebrew with people, like an Amharic. I just learned that because there, you know, there are mothers and stuff in the church who who, who will never learn English, <laughs> besides for their grocery shopping, you know, uh, they'll <laughs> never learn English. And uh, and so we we you know, in order to point them to to the scripture, we do. I I, I had to learn to say that. So like all the numbers. And a few words, you know, and, and just personal interest in conversation, you know, I learned a little bit about Amharic. In terms of the church, I would say chanting in Ge'ez and then everything else in English. And even some parts of the deacon that I think is important. For me, for example, you know, it's nice. The chanting is beautiful. I love the sound of it, right? Like, and the meaning. But uh, in the context for me, I would, certain certain, certain chants I wouldn't do. For example, and some may argue this, the other deacons may. Uh, Nakuto, for example, I say it in English. I, I know how to chant it in Israel, but I say it in English because it's important. Right? It's important for people to hear what. what, what and Nakuto, for those who don't know, it's when the deacon is returning inside of the Holy of Holies, the sanctuary, after the people have communed. He is giving thanks for the, the holy things that we have communed. Are there any parts of the liturgy, whether it's Nakuto, or any of the kind of more popular uh, g's, uh, the quick songs in in g's in English that we can get you to to chant for us and and sing for us, so folks could see the the g's and the English, or the the g's and the Amharic and the English, the kind of the interplay. Oh, I see. Uh, you won't you won't get the Amharic, but the g's okay. and the English, right? Perfect. So, um, so we'll we'll do uh, for example. The, the first after the tensu, right? So after the the service begins and uh the priest does a hadu and then the deacon chants tensu. So I, I'll chant tensu and then I chant the tsaliu, right? So I say Instead of saying his I say, Entreat ye and beseech that the Lord pity us and be merciful unto us and receive our prayer and supplication from the saints on our behalf, according to what is expedient at all times, so that he may make us ready to partake of the communion of the Blessed Sacrament. And then, So, yeah, this is how you do the is English mixture, you know? Yeah, you go back and forth. Very... That, yeah, parish to parish, you're going to see. Even here, you know, every parish is not going to copy the same. But it's something that we're hopeful that we start to have the conversation that we have like a one format, you know? Instead of every parish kind of doing their own thing, you know? And I know this something started before the whole reconciliation and all that. But now we have to go back and address it, I think, you know? I've been, you know, I'm born and raised hearing service done in a certain way with English. 
I mean, for example, the Our Father prayer, right? Virgin Mary prayer. I'm not sure what version you may heard here in English. 30, there are 30 versions. I've memorized okay, my own so, version. There are 30 versions. So the version I, I, I know since I've been a child, right? Like since I was four or five years old, learning how to pray. That's, so it's been, it's been, God has been hearing that prayer, that version of the English prayer my whole life. And so I think it's important for it, for this new movement in our church amongst the young people to incorporate English, to have this historical uh, connection to say, okay, it was already done here. So let's let's see how they did it there. I understand they may, you know, of course, as human beings, we're going to criticize certain things. For example, I still use the word thee and thou, right? Old English, thee and thou. Some people have to Google that word even, right? But uh, I, I, I don't mind. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. I don't it mind because as long as it, it distinguishes, right? It, like it distinguishes our God in prayer. And so I keep that. We keep that when we pray, you know, in English. Uh, uh, so the Virgin Mary prayer, and you know, there's a, there's a lot for uh, still a lot of work to be done. For example, with Asimariam, we have that in English. Um, a lot of the prayers we do not have in English. You know, even even what you shared with me, it was my first time even to know about this prayer, realistically, because we have so much in our treasury, right? Like Ethiopia is a treasury of knowledge. This is why us who are African descendants of slave, we see that and we appreciate it more. Uh, and so, um, you know, we have that desire to to get more in English translated. So, that Samariam is, is translated, uh, the, the liturgy. So, officially, only the liturgy was translated by the synodos. That Samariam never was never officially translated. But there's even that. There's thirty versions of that, right? Like, yeah, uh, I, I I've thought of even my my own version. Um, <laughs> and, and I went through an English translation alongside a Giz and Amharic. We did two days yeah. together, Sunday and Monday, interpreting and teaching on uh, the Marian praise. He did the rest of the week by himself. And there were some of those that was like, oh, I would have used a slightly different word. But there was one whole stanza. We were like, it's not even close. It's not even close. Like, I don't know who translated. It's not even close, you know. So, so even that, if you know the history, right, like how we... How so? Even me, coming from this unique background of how the Ethiopian Church came here, right? So, some historical lesson for some people who may not know: after Emperor Teredos of Ethiopia was overthrown by the British, they took a lot of the books from his personal library. Some, you know, uh, I don't know if it's exaggeration or it's true. They said they left a trail of books leading back to the Red Sea <laughs> uh, or wherever wherever port they came on in the ships. And so those books ended up in England. And of course, uh, they got them translated with the higher Ethiopian, the higher, they, they were translated. There was a, a particular person, uh, Sir Alfred Wallace Budge. He did a lot of work on a lot of the stuff for the British Museum. He was like one of the curators for the museum. And so, you know, he ended up translating a lot of those books that came from Magdala Library from King Tedros. And, um, for example, we have Ta'amr Mariam, we only have a portion of it, but, but Budge is is credited for translating uh, or, you know, organizing the translation. I don't know if he himself translated. You know, yeah, I, I visited your church and I've seen his translations. And when I visited Holy Trinity in New York, one of the things that shocked me at the time, the bishop, his beatitude, Abuna Zakarias was there. And Abuna Zakarias read the the Tamara Mariam, the Miracles of Mary in English. I had never heard that anywhere else. I've seen it in an academic setting. You know, I've yeah. seen people like a Professor Wendy Belcher and others, they study it at the Ivy Leagues. I had mm -hmm. never seen a bishop reading the Miracles of Mary in English. And that, that surprised me. Yes. Um, so that's a yeah, manuscript so difference. What you're talking about in academia, they call it manuscript differences. So you're saying the mm -hmm. base text is different, which is why the translation is different. That makes sense. Yeah. And and so even for so for us, before you even knew, like, you know, I grew up I, I, I grew up with the Vidasa Maria, and of course it was this version that came from the budge. So uh, you know, I, that I, I always knew that we needed to correct that, like eventually, you know. And even our teacher, when he came, he corrected it for the stanzas, for example, to divide it by sixty-four. There's, that's like a rule; you have to be sixty-four parts. So, how many parts from Monday, Tuesday, and so forth? And like, what's the beginning? What's the second? So, um, and there's other people who did works too. In Trinidad too, there's a big, you know, I, like I said, Trinidad was the first church, first country outside of Ethiopia to have the church in 1952. So, they had teachers there too. And you can look up their remnants of their works that they did. So even with that Samaria, we all had the same basis. We all use budge. 
So all these teachers came from Ethiopia. They all used budge uh, and tried to correct it to the best of their ability, not being yes. English scholars or anything like that. Uh, and so, so I get into languages a lot in this channel. So here I'm gonna I'm gonna push you a little bit because this is funny. So you know I read a book by a black linguist known as John McWhorter. He's actually from New York City as well, and he's a very famous black intellectual. And he talks about you know what's called standard English versus what's called black English. And one of the examples he gives is in Egypt, they have what's called the Fusha, which is a modern standard Arabic, but they have the Egyptian dialect. So when you mention to me Trinidad and Jamaica, Jamaica is very famous. Now the Rastas have their own I speak, but the, the Jamaicans themselves have a Patois, which is its own unique and valid dialect it's not, you know, it's not like dumbed down English. It has its own rules. It has its own grammar. And I, yeah. I think the Trinidadis have their, their own dialect as well. And I've even seen people from Trinidad and Jamaica comparing slang. Now, slang isn't everything, but they would compare slang. I've seen that on YouTube videos where it's even different between Trinidad, Tobago versus J Jamaica, let alone Guyana. I'm not even sure you could tell me what language they speak there. But I, I got to ask English. English? Okay. So yeah. what I got to ask you and, and push you on is now the church, it, I think, in the best case scenario, has translated into this kind of standard or, you know, what you call academic English. Has there been any work into translating into Patois or whatever the dialect in Trinidad and Guyana is? And what would, what would you think of that? So funny you mentioned that. There's actually a Bible, not, not related to the, like Tewahedo Church, like they did the Bible in Jamaican Patois. The New Testament? I think I've seen it. Yeah, and I've heard it. And I understand it, right? But um, a lot of Jamaicans have a problem with that. <laughs> why? T tell, because, tell me why. You I, know have, why? I have my own theories, but tell me why. You know why? Not many people have accepted it as the language that's derived, right? They accept the colonial... Uh, you know, to, saying that it's it, you, you dumbed down our English. They accepted that, and so some of them feel like Patois. Jamaicans, Indigenous Jamaicans, feel like Patois. Yes, is broken English. Yes. But we know, based on history, it's it's actually is derived from West African. You know, it's a mixture of different languages, uh, like a, a couple of different like Wolof and T a Twi or different West African languages. Um, so I did I did hear the Bible, and I understand it, but a lot of Jamaicans are. They criticize it. A lot of Jamaicans don't like it. Uh, I, I must say, when I heard it, I did laugh at first, but then yeah. I started to listen to it, and I, I like I said, I understand it. And I, and for somebody, you see, the thing is, in Jamaica, in the school, you don't learn Patois in the school. You can't. You don't speak Patois no. to the teacher. You don't. That's not. No, you speak English because yeah. you know, Jamaica was a British colony, so yes. Patois was like for the yard. You know, when you when you play with your schoolmates in gym class or whatever, but in school you spoke proper English, and so that you know that standard is still there. But um, so so John McWhorter, our when church, when John McWhorter talks about it, what he says is people who delve into patois or their dialect versus the standard English, it's because the speakers they are around. Number one, it's a more informal setting, and number two, they feel more familiar. So that you are talking about thee and thy as a way of feeling more familiar with God. I would argue, not only do we need English resources, we need Patois, we need mm. the different dialects, we need black mm. English for the United States, because this is where people feel most informal and where they feel most familiar. My theory is that if you see res what's called respectability politics, we touch on politics without getting into it too much. In the United States, what's called respectability politics is like, if you have someone like President Barack Obama, speaking in black English, people saying Ibanics, other people will feel like you're bringing all black people backwards. So the few, let's say Jamaicans who are able to speak, you know, the standard English better, who don't need the Patois, because some people might only be able to speak Patois. Um, those people would think, oh, you're bringing us backwards. So it's typically also not written. Like you said, it's spoken. Very rarely do you see like a full book. There might be now people who attempt to write full books, but it's usually a spoken language rather than a written language. So that when you see it written, actually how it's spoken, some people feel embarrassed. And in my opinion, nobody yeah. needs to feel embarrassed because like yeah. you said, it's a natural progression of the mixing of the languages. And I would just be curious to see what's the same and, and what's different, you know? 
For example, uh, one word. Uh, you want me to share some words with you? Please, <laughs> please share some. That's what you want? <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, one second. Let me... For example, one example. Uh, you all, right? Like to say you all, you would say uno. Like uno. And that's probably a West African word, actually. It means you all, right? To say children, you say picnic. Uh, to say, for example, they don't pronounce like TH. It's like a D. Actually, there's a good YouTube video. And I don't know if you follow this guy, Lang Focus. You know that guy? I'm this not guy, he, he does big on languages. And he did one in Jamaican Patois. And other Jamaicans, like, you know, they did like a review video of what his channel. He's like, wow, he did, he did his research, man. But, um, uh, there's a lot of words, and I can speak it informally. Like you said, I, I don't like we don't write it, right? So to see it written is like it's interesting. Um, but I understand what you're saying. It's, it is very informal, uh, but it can be effective, right? Like uh, you know, um, I would say that's that's kind of like our Lord's ministry, ministry, right? It wasn't really like formal. Yeah. Sometimes he would go and stand in high, but no, it was like it would happen. He would just start to speak, and so. Um, we I could use as an example. That. As an example, you said ten se'u. Earlier, you said ten se'u les alot. So the sequence happens about 15 times in the liturgy. Ten se'u yes. les alot. So arise for prayer. Lord, have mercy upon us. Or Lord, forgive us. And then the priest says, uh, Salam la kulikamu. Peace be with you all. So would yes. would you say in Patois, peace be uno? uno? Or how would you say <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Okay, I see what you're saying. It's still comical. We would. All right, so uh, peace be upon Uno, right? Peace so you be say upon like, Uno. Yeah, that peace be with you all. That's what it means, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so even like, and, and it'll be English words, it's just that they may not pronounce the S or they may not pronounce the TH, like the S. For example, uh, anything that, uh, anything that like ST. They just take the S off and just become T, for example. Stop. It's for some people, somebody, somebody, somebody say stop it. So that's the top it, right? They'll take the S off completely. Uh, anything with TH, so that become dot, you know. Uh, tan, tan them, up for prayer. Them, would it be them tan become up for them. Uno, uno stand up for prayer, right? So they won't say prayer. Like the ER is gone. The ER becomes A. So prayer, you know. Um, it, it will require somebody to really focus on it. For me, even for me, even for me to do this is abnormal. I never did that. <laughs> I never said it like that. But I understand what you're saying because, in reality, it, it is language. Like yes. people communicate that way every day of their life. Like that's all they know. And of course, in school, they know they have to pronounce, take time to speak and pronounce the words. You know, put on an accent. But um. I, yeah, I don't want to speak on behalf of your mother. But you, you talked about your mother getting introduced to Salot Kidan, the prayer of the covenant, and how beautiful it was in standard English. Can you imagine if it was like a perfect translation into Patois? I just know, you know, in, in Hebrew, in um, Acts 22, it talks about Paul and his ministry. We talked a lot about Jesus and his ministry, Paul and his ministry as well. It says that when he began speaking in the Hebrew tongue or the Aramaic language, they began hearing him even more than before. And so I'm, I just, I, I know there's nothing quite like your own language. So I'm imagining if people heard in their own dialect, what I just, I just imagine tears coming down of how, you know, happy, obviously there would be people who oppose and haters and, and all those things, just as there were, I'll give you a quick anecdote. Our Bishop, his beatitude, the Bishop of Southern California, his beatitude, Abu Nabarnamas, he was one of the first people to learn Amharic in the church. And so obviously he spoke Amharic growing up but they didn't have it in the church. And then w in his lifetime, they started adding it. So he said at one point, he spent a summer at his family's house and he began reading various things in Amharic. Before that, everything he had read was in Giz. So he comes back and because he could read better than everyone else, because they're only used to reading in Giz and he got a whole summer's worth of practice, the people at his church, he was a young deacon, they allowed him to read a lot of the, the readings in Amharic more so than other people. The young people got jealous. The old people... They looked at him with disdain and they said, look at this young whippersnapper. He's, he's reading the news because for them, it's like only, wow. only the newspaper, the Gazette is a Gazette. Amharic. 
Yeah, only wow. the news is in the mark. So he's not even reading a holy book. He's reading some random, like, wow. the news of the day. He's reading That's from a newspaper. And you see, I think Ethiopia is more unique because uh, there's, uh, you know, I don't know. You know, there's within the parts where there's so much English, like you can tell there's English, like the majority is 80% English, I would say, probably even more than that, you know? So, and that's why they say it's, it's English derived because the majority of it are English words, but we don't say it the same way, like, you know? Uh, but that'll be interesting, you know? I, I don't know how many Jamaicans would agree with you, uh, I'm gonna say, to be honest. Uh, they, they're probably like, what is, this, what is this guy talking? Just like how does old people, you know? But hey, we don't know what the future holds, you know? I would say that that the, that the priests in Jamaica, some of them, they, like in their sermons and talking to the people, if it's not all in English, like they might put some parts of words in there. And of course, you hear the accent, so they speak. Like recently, I was I was watching a video of one. And, uh, he definitely used Uno. God bless Uno. I, I remember he said he did that, and that that was that's not abnormal for them because like okay, we know what he meant, you know. So in Jamaica, yeah, but and like you said, it's spoken. But because because it's not written. Unlike Amharic and Biz, right? You guys had to, because it's not written, I think that that's where the difficulty lies, you know? Like, people are not used to reading Patua at all. And so, for me, when I read it, and everybody's going to write it a little different, too, because we're using English uh, character, Roman characters, you know? Absolutely. Not the word that, that was traditionally never written. It's not so, standard, like you said, with the Virgin Mary's prayer. It's not standard. There's no standard how you write the words. So, I, I my Uno might have one, and yours might have two. You know, <laughs> so, yeah. or or you might start with you. You might start with two O's. So you know, there is no standard, and I'm not sure if there will be. Right? Like maybe, maybe. Hey, yeah. maybe we'll, we'll, some, we'll, you and I are going to uh, be the standard thesis, or some <laughs> some doctor or somebody. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if, if someone if someone took the if someone took the English translation that we have, the standard English translation, they could translate it into patois, yeah, or a different dialect of their country. And then they could record it. For example, we have a local Coptic priest here, his Holy Resurrection Church. My cousin actually goes to that parish, and I've been there several times. His name is Father Cyril Gorgi. He has the Coptic liturgy in the standard English on iTunes. Mm -hmm. you know, and I've seen there's an Ethiopian from, uh, actually from New York, Malaka um, Gannet uh, from New know, York, right? uh, from Yonkers, Mariam. Yes. Yeah, he, he has a liturgy, I believe, on iTunes as well. Yes. It's not, you know, again, you it's mean not, like the chanting, right? Yeah, the chanting. Yeah, yeah. And, and so someone could do that, you know, in in a patois English, so that people get used to it in a spoken version. And then, if people request, they could come up with a transcript. And like you said, that transcript <laughs> might become the first manuscript for the future generation. <laughs> That's interesting. That's interesting. I'm not sure if I'm the best because it's not an, it's not my native language, but uh, that's interesting. We could we can pose it. I have some fellow some brother deacons in Jamaica who uh, <laughs> who are fluent more than I am. And, uh, see if see if it's something that you know they have to be willing to you know to try that. But that that'll be interesting. Uh, we yeah, we're just thinking out loud. We're just thinking no, out I know, loud. I know. I know. I, it's because still come. I'm still thinking about the audio that I heard the Bible. Like I heard the Bible within the patwa. And, and like I said, I understand it, but you you don't you don't expect it, you know. So, yeah. But uh, yeah, that's that's that is an interesting idea. Maybe we can go forward and, and do something, you know, and we, see how people just just to see how people receive it, right? Right? Yeah. You never know. It might be a flop, but it might be something good. So. Probably, yeah, probably I think I think consistency. Yeah, I think consistency huh? is what really works. So you know, if we if we did do it. I think if we did it consistently, you know, people would people would adopt it. There would be people who don't, and then there would be people who do just like the English language ministry that that you and I have been a part of. I want to thank you so much. I know it's also kind of late. I've, I've still got the sunshine out here in uh, in California. Even though it's past seven, yeah, I know it's yeah. a, a little later over there in the East Coast. But can you can you give any any parting advice? Would you say for for let's say, because you know we are focused on the English language ministry, so for for those folks who let's say know less is less Amharic, what any any words of advice or any words of encouragement for the English speaking diaspora who are you know trying to remain faithful in in the, specifically the Giz, you know because they can go to a lot of Coptic churches that are serving in English, but any sort of words of advice or encouragement you have yeah. for folks wanting to stay um, specifically in the Tawahado jurisdiction, but who who might have more limited Amharic and and 
and good is in more English. I understand. Um, one thing, one thing that's available in English that's been available for a long time that we should know very well is the Holy Bible. Um, you know, understanding the Holy Bible. Remember, it's not a book; it is a collection. It is a library. You have a miniature library at your disposal, so you can choose. Look through the catalog, choose a book. You know, something might speak out to you. Start to start to familiarize yourself with the Bible. Like, start to read it, study it, audio book. However, that's a good help in in keeping yourself right. Like, especially if your services are not like no English at all in your services, and sometimes you may go to the service and you may be distracted, right? Uh, I'm not telling you to read your Bible while the service is going on, please. Okay. At, your, at home, like study the Bible, study the story of the Bible, study study creation, study everything, the words of our Lord. Come to Kadasi. The service itself does something for you, whether you understand the prayers or not. Let your prayer be God. I don't understand the prayer, but a lot, you know, encourage me to continue to come. Encourage you. that should be the prayer, right? Uh, you know, prayer is so important. It's the it's the it's the main tool. Even if you don't know how to pray, you have to pray. Like pray that you pray about how to how do I pray? It's something I'm still learning. I'm still a, a novice at, right? But it's a powerful tool. Uh, learning learning the words of our Lord is is so helpful because then. Somebody can explain to you what's happening in the Kadassia. It's okay if you don't know what's being said, you know what's happening, right? Uh, for us who are deacons, we may know that, for example, the service begins with a, with a journey from Bethlehem, right? So if you're familiar with the scripture, then when you see these things, when you see the, it, it, it connects and it's the, the visual speaks for itself, right? Like our church is so visually, visually, visually rich. Everything around you have the icons and everything. Uh, and a lot of objects that we use throughout the service. So I would encourage those, of course, you have English, you have the English Bible at your disposal, whether it's in your phone, audio book, uh, however you, you you prefer. Be familiar with, with the gospel of the words of our Lord. Attend the liturgy. Um, the liturgy itself does something. The reason why we attend liturgy is for the ultimate sacrifice of the Holy Communion, you know, even if you don't know what's being said, there are prayers in English that you recite before you receive Holy Communion, after you receive Holy Communion. Um, you know, bring your Bible with you to the church because so if you don't know Amharic, at least learn the different names of the Bible. So that way, when they do, right, when they do uh, say whatever, what the Hebrew, what so what, he, uh, I don't know how to say it. Hebrawian. Hebrawian, so what, right? To the Hebrew people. So now you know, okay, that's Hebrews. And learn the numbers. So if you don't know Amharic, at least learn the numbers. Try. It won't take you more than a week. Most people, it will take maybe a week to learn the numbers, right? Now, maybe a little longer. But try to learn the numbers at least and then learn the names of the Bible so that way at least you can participate in your English Bible while they're, while they're doing, right? And of course, if you don't have a Kadasi in English, try to get that too. That little red one that we have. That's why it was developed for this purpose. So that way... The transliteration helps and with the English next to it. You know, that's a very good tool for a lot of people. And I, and I recommend that for people who are, especially English speak, speaking people who are come to the church, that book. And it's, it's available in PDF. I don't know if a lot of people know that. And we can share that here. I can share it with you. It's available in PDF. They don't have to print it. Or they don't have to buy it. Oh. Um, so those two things, I think, are, are, are a good tool to help with going to Kadasia. Going to Kadasia is important. Like attending liturgy is important. Even though you don't know what's being said at that moment, don't be frustrating, frustrated and then not, not allow yourself to learn, right? Like, uh, you know, try to understand, ask a question, somebody that can explain at least one thing every week, you know, like one thing every week. What, what, what are they doing there at that time? With the, you know, what's that, what's that being said? Where in this red book can I find it, right? Like, <laughs> even to navigate that book, you do need somebody to help you. I must say, you can't just like open it and start to know everything. So I would encourage people to to use those those tools. I think it would be very helpful to, to the beginning. And then, of course, through the grace of God, uh, if we are do, living our sacramental life, doing confession, taking Holy Communion, uh, that itself will transform us, you know? So, 
Amen. I'm a second low Xavier is telling the Akon Minilik. Thank you so much. This has been a pleasure. Glory be to God, beloved. Thank you again, uh, my brother. Uh, maybe in the future, we could do something again, another topic. Uh, anytime, you know. anytime, any topic. You let me know, brother. Okay, we'll do that.